Hello, folks. Um, I'm my deepest apologies for not being with you yesterday. I had complete internet failure. I went out, did some filming, came back, nothing was working, and the hotline said, uh, no, no idea when it's going to be back, so um, no show. So John Antal, Colonel Antal, who's going to be on last night's show, is coming back on June the 9th to talk about Eisenhower. He's an incredibly busy man. He's got a book out at the moment. He's doing work with the military because it's June the 6th because he talks about leadership on June the 6th. So it will come actually after leadership week. It'll come in the D-Day week, but he will be coming back and uh, you can catch him then. So that will be John Antal. Um, we might, of course, we're talking about leadership this week. Dr. Philip Blood is with us tomorrow night talking about SS leadership. And our sole show this week about a Soviet leader is tonight. Um, so joining me um, from Milton Keynes, Ollie Heppenstall. So uh, good evening, Ollie. How are you doing? I'm well. Thank you for having me on, Paul. It's an absolute pleasure. Well, it's uh, we were just saying before we went live, I try in these weeks to bring a blend of people, the kind of established, crusty historian and the younger first <laughs> or second rung of the ladder historians, because it's all important to give different voices, because course, there is, yeah. as we talk about in historiography, a, a generational look at these figures the historiography is that kind of way so younger people looking at these subjects look at it differently to people who are writing about it 30 40 years ago so i think mm -hmm. it's important to give a blend of voices so before we get into tonight's subject um how did you get involved in interest being interested in world war ii and why particularly the eastern front <sighs> So I can remember being about eight or nine and watching a wonderful film, Nicholas Alexander, about the last king and queen of Russia um, with my dad. Um, fantastic film. Do, do check it out. Um, I can remember asking him, sort of, do you know anything about this? And he turned out that he'd done Russia at O level when he was at secondary school, which is a long time ago now. And then not long after, there was a convention at University of Derby, not far, far from where I grew up. And I went along and I got talking to these guys who researched and recreated the the russian army of the first war and later the little factions that emerged in the civil war so i got involved with that and that began a, a nine or ten year career in reenactment of history and that that sort of wound down a bit when i did my degree um a couple of years ago and when i came to graduate i sort of realized i need to keep writing need to keep being creative and I just it just led me to creating front line to front page, which I've been creating for just under two years now. And that looks at the, the Eastern Front and the Soviet involvement in World War Two. Um it, it's it's my baby and it's something I'm immensely proud of. So And there is a link in the description below, folks. So uh check that out later. So the thing about the Eastern Front is is I've been finding in my limited knowledge of it, because it's not my area of speciality, is you kind of like everything else, there's the context of what happened before you have to look at the Second World War, you have to understand the revolution. To look at the revolution and the Civil War, to understand that, the First World War. Then you start going back into the mid-19th century, and you feel you kind of need all that context to, to bring you right up to World War II. And indeed, I think you have to have a knowledge of what happened in the country and the breakup of the Soviet Union post-World War II, because all of that has a bearing on what was happening in World War II itself. So it's, it's a big subject to kind of dive into. But... Who are we talking about tonight, and why so, did you choose this particular gentleman? So tonight we're talking about Konstantin Rokossovsky. Um, he's one of the the, the 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 top echelon of Soviet generals during World War Two, mainly commanding front levels. The, 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 Red, the Red Army referred to army groups as as fronts, um, and he he is essentially the best of what's already a very strong crop of young officers who had been young men, sort of teenagers in the First World War. They'd seen the misery and death and the stalemate of, of that conflict. They then sort of adopted the, this idea of mass armoured warfare in the 30s, which is very much at odds with um, a lot of older Bolsheviks, people like Semyon Timoshenko, uh, colleague Rokossovskis, people like Clement Voroshilov, um, an old Bolshevik a political and military leader, and uh, people like Semyon Bajoni, people who are very much old school and who could never really grasp that massed armoured formations would replace traditional horse cavalry. Um, and it and so Rokossovsky and a lot of his contemporaries, they sort of suffer for that a little bit. Rokossovsky especially, as we'll find out later on. Um, as I said, he, he's the, 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 the best of a very strong group of officers who, who are given their shot when the old guard really, really fluffed their lines during Operation Barbarossa. And they, they gradually work their way up to being these this, this iconic, especially within the context of how Russia looks at that conflict, iconic, almost mythical individuals who, who are the architects of the downfall of, of fascism. Mm -hmm. And yet, interestingly, he's not actually Soviet in the sense he was born in, in, in Poland. So that's the interesting thing. Mm -hmm. He's not your traditional 
figure to kind of rise within that regime. Tell us about where he where he came from. So Rokosovsky was Polish by origin. He was born in Warsaw um, to what you might consider these days as, as middle class surroundings. His family were minor Polish nobility and his father, I think, was a railway official. His mother was a teacher, which is very much at odds with sort of the Soviet Union and communism and, and especially the Red Army. A lot of his colleagues in the Second World War were born to quite quite humble, quite salt of the earth peasant backgrounds. Um, and and they, they're, they're, that background is, is echoed in their early careers. A lot of them were in the infantry and the artillery. Rokosovsky was in the cavalry um, during the First World War and he did very, very well. Um, he was decorated a number of occasions. He, when Russia withdraws from that war, he is a, a senior non-commissioned officer um, in the cavalry and that carries on. Most of the 20s and 30s he spends fighting uh, a lot of a lot of the whites in Mongolia and Siberia. Fascinating period of history, do look it up, wish I had time for it today. Um, he, he spends most of his time kind of in cavalry and there's a photo of him here at the Leningrad Cavalry Academy where he meets and forms a friendship with Georgi Zhukov, who is perhaps the best known Soviet military leader from the, from the conflict. He also forms a rivalry, quite a, a, a well-published rivalry um, within within the context of 39 to 45. Um, so yeah, his his origins are very much at odds with lots of his colleagues and sort of the ideal Soviet um, man. Essentially, he, he's not only is he Polish, he's from reasonably privileged, reasonably sort of well-to-do background, which is quite unlike a lot of his colleagues. And that kind of contradiction is interesting because you've got, as you say, the classic kind of Soviet leader that's coming through is your working class peasant kind of from outside of Moscow, outsider. And then also in the same time, the 20s and 30s, you've got this um, debate between, the, as you said, the continuation of a kind of a cavalry attitude horses to the modern mechanized way and you know we, i've had when gareth davies has been on talking about the british armor development in the 30s and i've had um prit Butar on talking about the soviets we tend a lot of us who don't know much about the soviet front or soviet um, armies and well would think of this sort of blunt unprecision tool this sending just lots of everything and lots of manpower but actually there have been some lots of discussions in in russia about how to modernize their army how to take take the what they learned in the civil war and and become a, a, a world power in that sense and to have an army and a, and, a, and a military that could be capable of engaging on the world stage so he kind of fits in i think kind of covers lots of bases i suppose that's he's he's a, a chameleon maybe in that sense he's 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 a little bit of outside but that means he's he's kind of in lots of clicks he gets to know the right people but i'll, I'll hand back to you to explain the next chapters of his career and then i will jump in as i always do with questions and comments and if anyone's watching got any particular questions for for you because it won't be for me uh share them and we'll do that but um i'll hand back to you to, to kind of carry on the presentation really so uh Rokosovsky begins well in, in the late 30s he starts kind of badly he he ends up being in prison during the purges um his former boss on the left hand side that's vastly Buker. he's there's some guilt by association here as well as his his adherence to this new idea of waging war with with large armoured formations. Vasily Bluka essentially takes the fall for an NKVD defection to the Japanese Empire um, while, while he was out in the Far East. And, and Rokosovsky's association with him contributes to his being in the good. Like this. There's also the connection where um, Rokosovsky is accused of being on the books of Japanese military intelligence, which is a total fabrication. He did meet up with the Japanese but it was to do with dealing with prisoners in a, a really small border conflict in the late 20s. Um, on the right, that's, Gyor, that's a young Georgi Zhukov, a great friend of Rokosovsky's and also a great rival as well. Um, so Rokosovsky spends about three years in the gulags. Uh, he's, he's tortured, he's beaten, he's, he suffers several mock executions as well. But he's then recalled in 1940. By this point, the Red Army has had a set to with the Finns um, just north of Leningrad, and they performed really poorly initially. And there's, there's this realisation that actually imprisoning your most competent officers um, perhaps isn't the best idea. Um, so he, he's reinstated to command and during Barbarossa doesn't have the best sort of few weeks, months. Um, and then we get to autumn 1941 and the Battle for Moscow. So Rokosovsky at this point is commanding 16th Army. They hold position along the Volokolamsk Highway, which is one of the main thoroughfares into Moscow now as it was then. Um, right in the eye of the storm. Um, this is Army Group Center at sort of their their, their peak of the power, really. And it, it's Rokosovsky's reconstructed from scratch um, army who are one of, who form the northern wing of the Soviet defenses at Moscow. So uh, just 
there you go, right in the centre, sort of with Majes to the south and Klin to the north, northeast. So Rokosovsky holds a line at Moscow, and a lot of what he learns at Moscow, he, like any good officer, um, keeps it in his back pocket just in case it comes in handy later on, which we'll see. So about a year later, if you'll move on to the next slide, please, Paul. Um, no, I want to just um, elaborate on the Moscow and Barbarossa, because we kind of went over that pretty good. No, no one comes out of Barbarossa particularly well because of the suddenness of how it all happened and, and you know, no, you're the, right. the, you're the, right. the shock That's aspect of it. But, you know, at that point, Stalin, well, all through Stalin's reign, he's he's not got patience with people more than once. Does if, if you screw up under his command, you, whether you're a politician or an army leader or anybody, it's gone off. I mean, and he's on kind of thin ice in this sense because of, you know, coming out of the gulag. He's got that kind of black mark over him, although clearly Definitely. he's got a survivable. He's he's clearly a survivor. He's, he's, he's He knows how to kind of bide his time and wait for his opportunity to come. And then when he gets it, he's going to kind of... Um, uh, Take it. So, in that defense of Moscow, you know, in Moscow, you said he's important there. What what kind of leadership qualities does he start showing? Would you say that that gets him that gets him recognized? If you know what I mean. I think the the, the main one is being able to acknowledge when the situation is, is starting to get out of hand. There's a particular instance. I think it's towards the end of October where he 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 goes over the head of one of his superiors. I forget exactly who, but he he goes over the head of his superiors to you know to request look to say look we can't we can't hold this position. We need to move somewhere else. I've found somewhere that works better. Let, let's do it. And quite sadly, he's refused and, and 16 on we do hold on the end. But he's got an independent streak about him that I think is fostered by his time in, in Siberia during the Civil War um, and Mongolia as well. A lot of that conflict is spent a long way from home supply bases, acting on your own, on your own initiative in quite fast-paced combat situations. And I think that experience stood him in quite good stead because he's, he's not afraid to go over the head of his superiors. He's not afraid to, when he's got this idea, when he's got this plan, he's not afraid to defend that and say, no, this is going to work. Trust me on this one. We'll see that a bit later on um, as the Second World War progresses. But it's definitely a case of not being afraid to to back his own ideas, essentially, and say, look, this is this is going to work better. Let's do this, rather than just you know sitting there and, and, and letting the inevitable pan out. So it's an independent yeah, yeah. I mean, there's conversations in the sidebar about the torture. He was, you know, we're going back to Gulag days there, and you people say, is it true he had his teeth all bashed out? Is it true he had his fingernails, toenails? We can come on that in a minute. But the point is, whatever that he did or didn't endure, that's kind of going to be the worst time of your life. Anything after that isn't going to be as shit as that time there. So I suppose if he gets threatened with, uh, you go, to the, he's been there, he's done it. There's, I, I suppose that's going to give him a, a no fear attitude of where others are worried about the what ifs. There must be other Russian Soviet officers who've heard rumors about this. They've they've hear, heard about gulags. They've heard about punishment cells. They've heard about this. Well, he's been through that. He's been through every yeah. aspect of that. There's nothing that's going to phase him now. So it's like, you know, you when you said you know he dis you know going over the head of superiors or not taking that's that's kind of a bold thing in the in the Soviet army at that point. There are a lot of um rule followers i would guess in in the, in yeah. the machine at that point so the the best way to understand this is dur during the purges of the the mid to late 1930s it, it was a pretty comprehensive um process while a lot of soviet officers were imprisoned and then re sort of re reintroduced into the army um that there were executions obviously to give them but a, a, a pretty hefty amount were you know just imprisoned and, and tortured which is in itself horrendous um the the dual there was this thing called dual command where um at i think battalion level upwards there was a what's called a commissar political officer and it's, it's quite early on that this 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 emerges but they the, these commissars had the the ability to countermand orders that were perhaps not seen as politically sound which in a lot of cases in in some cases in barbarossa it, it does lead to as well as the army just being taken totally by surprise and not being in any fit state to to wage a modern war, they've also got this 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 yoke hanging over them. That even though in some with some cases you've got commissars being reasonably competent, an awful lot more are um, perhaps not quite so much, and they're they're countermanding the orders of, of competent officers who understand the situation perhaps better. Um, and and there is this this especially among younger officers, perhaps lower down the army, there is this this culture of fear, and that that doesn't disappear until a reasonable amount of time into the conflict itself 
So what Rokostovsky is not uh, unique in that. I just want to ask about this question here from JD um, from the History Underground because I think it's um uh, it's pertinent at this point because you know we're talking with Peter um, uh, Caddick Adams on Monday about Monty and Rommel they're overcoming kind of in Monty's case of a speech impediment lost his wife there's there's reasons you want to be a good leader beyond just serving your country sometimes it is purely about achieving what you are achieving for the the country that you are part of. But he's he's experienced some of the shitty side of the Soviet Union. So when he's becoming this this kind of general, people are noticing around the time of Moscow. What do you think his personal motivation was? And before you answer that question, I'll give you a second one to answer at the same time. Because Scott Grimwood asked about your sources, because we said before going online there aren't any particularly good biographies available. So you know, so what what are your what are your sources when you're trying to understand the, the, the Eastern Front? So two questions there. First is, what's his motivation, you think, for being successful? And second, are your sources? Motivation, I think, was a case of just having a job to do. I think it was a, 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 a rather than sort of personal loyalty to, to the Soviet Union, it was more a case of, this is I'm a soldier, this is what I've been trained to do, this is what I'm good at, let's make it work. Um, in terms of sources, I'd love to get access to Rokostovsky's memoirs, but they, they are difficult to come by and expensive as well. In terms of books in general on the Eastern Front, uh, John Erickson's two books on Stalingrad and Berlin are very, very good. Um, I'm a huge fan of Peter Tsouras. He's got, got a, uh, The Great Patriotic War out. That's quite dated now, but as a general overview, it's very, very good. Um there are some such that there's there's i'm trying to think um anthony tucker jones's bagratian book is reasonable um there's there's a lot more out there i'd need to think about it first but there are there are good sources out there it's easy to say what to avoid um the the the, the first one springs to mind avoids stalingrad by anthony beaver that's been there's a lot of that's been debunked um i think a lot of beaver's eastern front stuff is is, is worth avoiding but it's a different conversation to have um, I would also, uh, yeah, it's easy to say what to avoid, but definitely avoid avoid what Anthony Bieber's written because a lot of that, it has been a good yarn. He's a fantastic writer, but as a historian, that there there are better out there, and there are, there are instances where there's lots of garnish, but not quite so much meat. So Anthony Tucker Jones, um, Peter Turas, and John Erickson are perhaps my my three go tos for for anything Eastern Front. I think also Anthony Beaver that comes into that historiography side of things that he was, I know he's still writing now, but he's more in that Max Hastings era, that kind of 80s, 90s, when we had a different view about the war generally than perhaps we do now in the in the, in the the James Holland, Prit Boutard, Peter Caddick Adams era. So yeah, um, I, I read Beaver's starting, well, I don't know when it first came out, I suppose, and was kind of spellbound by it. But now I kind of look at it and think it's actually a bit lacking in detail here and there. And it's anyway, there's a side side story there. But let's get back. You wanted me to bring on the next slide there. So um, let's get back to talking about we've done Moscow. So um, show me now, how it kind of rises. Now, now th so by 1942, by the end of 1942, Rokossovsky is in command of Donfront, a little place you might have heard of called Stalingrad. Um, they're deployed north of the city. Um, and in, the, in November 1942, the Red Army basically realised that with, with the Germans being so ground down and, and bogged down in this in, in this fighting build to Perry situation, which they're not really set up for, they realised that actually, with the way the Germans are, counterattack sort of makes sense. And Rokossovsky is integral to that happening. He is present at a lot of the top level discussions between uh, the other front commanders and Georgi Zhukov, who is basically Soviet high command's representative along the front line. He's integral in the the reconnaissance aspect of it. A lot of hit, a lot of the reconnaissance done in his sector. It goes a long way to aid in the actual breakthrough. Um, and he's also a bit of a whisper with supplies. He's much more mindful with the resources at his disposal than uh, Zhukov, for instance. Z Zhukov used him as a battering ram. Rokossovsky is a bit more mindful and a bit more careful. But um, Rokossovsky's front go on the offensive November nineteenth, nineteen forty two, and they they fly out the gates. They they I think they're faced down by Italian troops. Um, to the north of the city, and they they make pretty short work of them. It takes about a week, about a week and a half of fighting, for Dom Front and Southwestern Front to link up, to link up at the town of Kalach. And in in doing that, they they encircle about a quarter of a million German troops in the Stalingrad Castle. That's not only within the city, but in the surrounding area, just to the just to the west of the city. Um, it, it's the first time that 
that the Soviet army, the Red Army, goes on the offensive um, in any great sort of numbers. Um, there, there is the Yelnya offensive in September 1941. That's much, much smaller. That's a few divisions. This is this is the first time that three army groups have been organised, supplied, done the reconnaissance, done the groundwork. This is the first time that they've really gone and put what they've learned in the first sort of 15 months of the war to good use. And they've come out brilliantly. Um, it, it's a resounding success. And um, there's a great line in John Erickson's Stalingrad book that basically says the Red Army had caught Tiger by the tail. They initially thought they'd encircled around sort of 80,000, 100,000 German troops. It turns out that encircling a quarter of a million in the in the remnants of this city, it, you know, they, they've done far, far better than their expectations. And as we'll see in the Operation Ring map just to the right, um, it's it's Rokossovsky's men who are given the job of actually squashing the pocket and, and, and finishing the job. And as you can see, Rokossovsky deploys a good four or five armies um, to what remain against what remains of Sixth Army's divisions. You know, a, a lot of those German formations there are sort of skeleton crews, if you like. Um, not only are they trying to hold position within the city itself, but they've also got airfields to hold. They've got quite a wide open space to defend. And against rampaging Soviet tank and mechanised formations, it, it, it's a difficult job, even at the best of times. So with Stalingrad capitulating and Sixth Army surrendering, that really sort of kicks off this this era. Rokos obviously coming into his own and establishing himself as not only one of the Red Army's best generals, but I think one of the best generals of any army between 39 and 45, as we'll see are the next two instances I've picked out. I mean, before we do into that, I want to talk about the 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 gradual, well, the, the, the quite swift change, in fact, in his case, from being involved in defensive operations to offensive operations if we're going to broaden out and talk about what we're talking about this week in terms of leadership you get people i could you could argue that rommel goes from offensive in 1940 offensive in north africa a bit of defensive and then normally and then well he doesn't he didn't end up being particularly significant normally because of the, the strafing but that was a defensive montgomery you know goes that it's very unusual to find a senior general who's kind of good at both. They tend to be known for the defensive qualities or the offensive. And the, the, the best Soviet ones, it seems to me, and in my limited knowledge, are those that can adapt quite quickly from that one side of warfare. Because, you know, it was all hands again on the pump for the, you know, 41 um, in, in, in the Soviet Union. It was all defense, defense, fallback, defense, defense, defense. And then, and then almost immediately following Stalingrad, it kind of turns into a, an offense. I know there's other um, nuances along the way there, but you had, he does seem to adapt quickly from one side of war for another. Do, do you think that's a flexibility of having a variety of things in his background, the cavalry aspect, the 20s civil war? Where do you think that ability to kind of adapt quickly comes from? I think it is a mixture of, of background and having seen the misery and stalemate of, of the First World War and the trench warfare that, that did take place on the Eastern Front and just as much as the Western Front. I think it's also it comes. I think it also comes from this idea of, in the 30th Red Army, having looked into and partially championed this idea of of mass mechanized offensive warfare. I mean, the Red Army anticipated fighting an offensive war in 1940. They did. They did not expect to be on the back foot in quite the way they were. I think it's a mixture of of prior experience of recognizing this idea that that made so much sense and was was sort of played down a bit and, and, and people scapegoat as a result of that. I think it's a mixture of, of, of his, his own experiences and the Red Army just studying. The Red Army studied everything that the Germans did. They studied everything that they got wrong themselves and they were excellent at, as the war goes on, applying what they'd learnt. Um, I mean, we'll, we'll come on to Kursk very shortly, but a lot of the mistakes, a lot of what the Red Army does well at Kursk they have learned to do. They have learned how to dig in as such and how best to, to combat mass tanks. So we'll come on to Kursk, you know, given the maps there. Um, Rokossovsky by now commands Central Front and they, they, they again, are just, just like at Moscow, they're in the eye of the storm. They're holding the northern half of the Kursk salient and this, this, this salient, it is absolutely huge. We're talking hundreds of miles um, from north to south, east to west, such that the Red Army's operational reserve for this operation was an entire army group. Um, it wasn't just a few divisions. It wasn't just a few corps. It was an entire front. Um, 
And what, what the Red Army just say, well, here is defence in depth. There are three defensive belts dug in. If you were to if you were to stretch out the trenches in terms of length, they would stretch from Moscow to Madrid. The scale here is just unbelievable in terms of what the Soviets are trying to do. Um, not only that, they've got more minefields and barbed wire than you, than you can shake a stick at. And they also concentrate their anti-tank defences into strong points. They scour the army for the, for the best gunners and gun layers, for the best crews. The pay is raised. The, the, even the, 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 the rank and file in the rifle divisions are given, you know, quite a significant education on how to how to stop attack. And that that plays into Rokotovsky's hands quite nicely because everything that he learned at Moscow in terms of not being afraid to go over his superiors and in terms of knowing how best to stop an armoured armor offensive, that comes right into play at Kursk. When the Germans kick off, it takes about four days for Central Front to, to sort of blunt the, the penetration. They reduce the width and the depth of the penetration and they, they, they do that in an astonishingly short space of time. It's as much down to Rokosovsky having learnt from what didn't go quite so well at Moscow and um, being confident in his own abilities and the men under his command. It's as much that as it is the Red Army studying and studying and studying again what went wrong and what went well. Um, and it, it, it's the efforts of Rokosovsky's central front and also uh, Voronezh front to the south, which enables the Red Army's relatively limited army reserves because they only have sort of 14 or 15 tank and mechanised formations across those entire five army groups compared to the Germans who massed, you could call it an armoured supergroup, some of the best known and best written about armoured formations of the entire conflict, regardless of, 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 of which armour they belong to. It says quite a lot that Rokosovsky's defensive now is such that the Red Army can capitalise on that by beginning to counterattack and really ruining the last chance the Germans had of reigniting the offensive war they'd wanted to fight for so long. Um, it's the last chance saloon for them. Put everything put on red, and it's in part, it's thanks in huge part to Rokosovsky and his colleagues that that gamble does not pay off. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, so we've got. I'm, I'm going. I'm going. So having some thoughts because I'm trying to link these the other shows you got this week and leadership. Yeah, you know, as a, as a general theme. So you're saying about this introduction of tactics and anti tank units and mines that, and you now do you, is. Is Rokosovsky the kind of guy to have these ideas himself? Does he listen to other people's ideas? I mean, we've got Simmons coming up on Thursday. Guy Simmons was a lot of the ideas came from himself and he, in, he implemented them by his own initiative. Then you get other people like Eisenhower, who we should have talked about last night, although he's an overall commander rather than a battlefield commander, who is very good at delegation and very good at taking his advice from others around him. So where do you think... Um, our subject today sits in that. Is it, does he have the ideas and implement them, or does he take them from somewhere else, or is he a bit of both, really? Is he a good kind of all-rounder? I'm inclined to say it's a bit of both. I think it's a mixture of, as I said, the Red Army studying what worked and what didn't, and I think it's also Rokosovsky's own initiative. Um, the, there's a the great quote attributed to him at the beginning of the war, basically saying, the German army is a machine, and machines can be broken. I think it's this not only being willing to learn from mistakes and, and figure out what, what worked and what didn't work, but I think also knowing that there would always be a way, there'd always be something they could try, no matter how no matter how ridiculous it may seem. There was always something, there's always a way around these things. Problems have solutions. And I think Rokosovsky was just very good at not only coming with them him, with them himself when we'll see during Operation Bagration, mm. but I think having people around him who, as I say, were very competent. They'd seen they, 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 they had a rough idea of what worked, what didn't work, and developing that was, was something good at. The, the anti-tank units um, that I mentioned, they they become their own branch. They have their own insignia um, on the shoulder of uniforms, and it, it's something that the Red Army become very good at. In, units emerge from an idea, and they become sort of part of the wider accepted all bat and, and, and the wider way of, of waging war. So it's, it's a mixture of things. It's Rokosovsky's own experience, people around him, and just improvisation that happens to work really well um, in a way that you perhaps don't see with lots of other commanders. Yeah. yeah. And my next question, because I just enjoy this bringing in the themes we're talking about, is that we know I've got several on my own shelf of people who are on, for example, Montgomery staff and lots who want Eisenhower staff. They talk about whether it was a relaxed environment or a stressful environment, do we have any idea, given the limitation of what's been put into English language, about what it was like being like a staff officer under his command? Or, you know, is he 
Is he a tyrant? Is he a, I mean, these are maybe stupid, facile questions, but I just want, is there much information about that? Or is what the, you can find very much kind of the party line come out of the Soviet army where there isn't much honesty there? What's your feeling about what, if, if you're a major, for example, and you're attached to his headquarters because you're an expert in, let's say, landmines, do you think it's a nice environment to be in or is it is it what you're watching your ass all the time? I can think of worse environments to be in. Um, quite frankly, Yogi was quite is quite well known as, as being very, very unforgiving and very, very, very much a taskmaster. And I think Rokosovsky is too. Rokosovsky is very uncompromising. He's he's quite headstrong. There's a line in, in one of the books I've got that talks that there's a, a, a the line that Zhukov written about him prior to the war. And it, it part, part of this includes that Rokosovsky cannot do staff or desk jobs because he constitutionally hates them. So I think with 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 that in mind, I think it's I can think of worse staffs to be on. Um, I'm not overly familiar with who Rockstar's chief of staff was as such. Mm -hmm. I think it changed over time. But I, I can think of worse staffs to be on, mainly Zhukov's. Um, I, Zhukov is, is worthy of, of an episode himself. He's a fascinating character. Um, but he, he's he's uncompromising, but not tyrannical with it, I think. I think Rokosovsky was results-driven, but not to the point of, of, of using men as a battering ram. Maybe you can call it an instance of that. Um, when the Battle for Sale of Heights happens in April 1945, Zhukov sort of reverts to type and throws throws everything at it. Rokosovsky is a bit more measured than that, and I think that, com I think that would have played into how his staff operated as well. Um, that being said, Zhukov's chief staff by the war, Vasily Sokolovsky, um, absolute genius. Um, another fascinating individual who I wish I could cover more on this show. Um, there were competent officers around him in terms of in terms of staff. And I think Rokosovsky was less less intimidating than Zhukov, but still intimidating as well um, in his own sort of way. I mean, it's interesting what you said there about the fact he didn't kind of like the staff because he hated that aspect himself. Because as a as a leader himself, there's two ways he could handle that. Because he hated it, he could kind of hate them for being good at something he's not good at and doesn't like. Or he could say, actually, I'm going to really respect those guys because it's not something I could do, but it's an integral part of where I'm going and I need their expertise alongside me. And it's, you know, we, we, as I'm saying, I'm repeating myself, we know a lot about the the, the, the British and the Canadian and, the, and, the, uh, and even the German leaders in some regards. The Soviet side of things, the Red Army, there is a little bit, little bit more mystery, a little, little bit more reading between the lines because of that lack of information, certainly the lack of information in English language and what have you. So it's interesting, you know, I feel that we're discussing someone that we've only like got half the picture of what he's like, really. Um, and, it, you know, it, it would need someone like yourself, go and learn Russia, go and live out there for a few years, get some I wish. And, kind of, and, and do, <laughs> I wish. That, do that all embracing detailed kind of um, biography because you know, th th he's clearly an interesting person. There's clearly more to this subject that, that you'd like to get to. But anyway, I'll let you move on with your presentation. It's just it's it, it, it's good stuff. People are enjoying it. So are we are we still at Kursk or are we done Kursk? I we're, going, we are we're, now. we're going to what I consider to be the Red Army's and Rokosovsky's pièce de résistance, um, Operation Bagration. So by so June 1944, obviously the Norman landings happen and the Germans have got the Americans, the British, the Canadians, the Poles, all manner of, of troops sort of bashing down the door through northern France. And the Red Army realised that actually they've got their own problem. Um, you can see in, in the Ukraine and, and in Belarus, you've got um, Army Group Centre and the Belarusian balcony hanging over the Ukraine, New, not long liberated, sort of end of 1943. And the Red Army so realises actually this needs to go. They realise that the, the Army Group Centre needs needs a good kicking and they give Rokosovsky that job, essentially. So. Rokosovsky organises four fronts um, on a two-pronged assault, so two simultaneous assaults. They, he's able to not only organise these four fronts, but also about 6,000 tanks and armoured vehicles in what is quite tank-unfriendly country. Belarus, as it's now known, is, is not. It's very swampy. It's quite marshy. Um, there weren't many good roads through, the, through those environments. So it, it's a bit of a logistical um, achievement to get those tanks there in the first place. And also the logistics and organisation involved in setting the Red Army up for what's basically the best part of three months of non-stop offensive warfare. Um, there's also a huge amount of deception involved. Um, Ivan Konyev, a colleague of his, is tasked with that. And that, that's fascinating as well. Another episode, possibly. But um, not only is Rokosovsky tasked with this huge plan of, of attack, 
Um, he's also tasked with defending this plan against the boss. Um, he meets up with Stalin on a number of occasions, and every single time, Stalin says, think it over, come back with something different, there has to be another way. And on every time he's told to do that, Rokossovsky comes back and says, no, this will work, trust me. And as, as with Operation Uranus at Stalingrad, Bagration is a runaway success. Um, Army Group Centre really do get, get their teeth kicked in. Um, they're sent into headlong retreat pretty much all the way for the, for the rest of the war. And by by the time sort of autumn 1944, I was around late summer perhaps, the Red Army are, they're into Poland, um, they've reached Warsaw, they're, they're looking at East Prussia and thinking, that looks appetising. In, in the Baltic states, they've started to encircle Army Group North. Um, and in the south, they've got their gun sites trained on Hitler's Balkan allies. The last two serious ones are Romania and Hungary. If Bagration does not go well, those two outcomes do not happen. Um, and I think it's a huge testament to Rokossovsky's ability and self-belief and calibre as a leader that he's able to, A, formulate this plan, B, keep the Germans guessing all the way through the process of, of the build-up, C, defend his plan against the boss, um, and D, have it go as exceptionally well as it does. Um, it, it really does start to cause headaches for the Germans because not only have they got the Western Allies in Normandy, um, they've also got a Red Army that's figured out how to do offensive warfare, warfare, warfare and doing it brilliantly in really quite tank and friendly country in Belarus. So, as I said, Bagration is Rokossovsky's masterpiece um, for a variety of different reasons, and it really does. It, it is the 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 last nail in the coffin for me for for Nazi Germany, and it is Rokossovsky at the peak of his powers. Yeah, no, yeah. I agree, and I wanna I wanna develop on the relationship with Stalin because I think that's very interesting, and there's some more conversation in the sidebar going on about Zhukov's relationship with Stalin, Stalin, where he ends up kind of. Um, Stalin kind of pushing Zhukov to, is it Zhukov's um, schedule or Stalin's schedule? Rokossovsky's kind of in a skating on thin ice in the fact you made the point he's standing up to Stalin. Now, Stalin, we know he respects Zhukov. We know Zhukov stays in, and I love his portrayal by Jason Isaacs in, in The Death of Stalin, which is just this kind of cemented how I perceive him, even though probably he wasn't actually a Yorkshire. Yeah, I, that's a fantastic film. Fantastic Death of Stalin. Go and watch it. You know, that's brilliant. But it's quite a bold move to kind of stand up to Stalin because it, it could work for you, but it could absolutely backfire on you because in a, I know, I know by Bagration, Bagration is an important and it's, you know, it's his, it's his crowning moment. But by that point, of the war from, from the bigger Stalin point of view is the kind of the, the um they've had their dunkirk moment they've had their they've had their leningrad and stalingrad it's kind of the tide has turned it's pushing the germans out now it's pushing the germans it's on to berlin definitely, so definitely. if stalin wanted to just replace anybody it's not like he couldn't just do it at that point so standing up to him is 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 a say a, th a thin icing so i you know we're going with asking what i asked about already but do we have do we have any idea about He's did he ever write anything that we know about of of, of kind of doubts about standing if, up to Stalin or anything like that? If, I mean, it's a bold move. If if it's out there, I didn't come across it. I, I I'd love to if it, if it does exist, but I think by that point, I think Rokossovsky had earned Stalin's respect in quite a big way because not only has he defended Moscow, he's helped liberate Stalin City. Um, and I think by that point as well, he's he's proven himself. He's not just he's not just some upstart pole who 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 is a fait accompli in 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 uh, a potentially disloyal officer, and I think I think it was a case of Rokossovsky having earned respect the hard way, um, and I think Rokossovsky's post-war fate, it, it's probably better than Zhukov's. Zhukov is shuffled off into a military district. Rokossovsky becomes a, he's very important in in post-war in immediately post-war Poland. He's the Ministry of Defense, I think. So yeah, I think it's a case of his having earned Stalin's respect, and I, th I think admiration to have come back from being very much a disgraced, a wrongly disgraced um, sort of young upstart to becoming one of the main architects and, and actors in, in, in the Soviet Union's sort of baptism of fire. Because bear in mind that in 1941, the Red Art, the, the Soviet Union is only, it's barely 20 years old. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think it's a case of respect being earned. So we'll look now at um, Army Group, that's the, the East Prussian operation. So by this point, 
while Zhukov is given the task of, 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 of taking Berlin, Rokossovsky is in East Prussia and to lesser extent the Baltic states. East Prussia could have been a nightmare for the Red Army. Um, by this time, the German army were a bit like a wounded tiger, not perhaps at full capacity, but if they got their act together and hit the right places, it could have been quite nasty. Um, they're also, by this point, very, very close to their home supply bases, and they're, they're fighting for what is hallowed ground. East Prussia was the most powerful German state prior to unification, and it was the most powerful state within the German Empire of the First World War. And it, it's a weird mix of, of fighting and built-up areas, um, case in point, Königsberg, um, fascinating battle. Do look do look into it if you haven't already. And oh, another mi and a mix of fighting and, and, and quite long sort of long sight lines, rolling farmland, little towns and villages. And given what we know about East Prussia and given what I just described, it could have been very easy for uh, a, a less competent officer, for instance, um, to have made a bit of a mess of, of East Prussia and taken away from the focus being on Berlin. Um, but to Rokossovsky's immense credit, he's able to not make it look straightforward. It's, it's not, but he, he does a good job of managing that situation and not detracting from the fact that, oh my goodness me, we're in Berlin, this is it, you know, let's not throw away our shots. Um, and he's, he's able to, to to bring things to a fairly straightforward conclusion in East Prussia. Um, by, by spring, um, East Prussia, and especially the Baltics, they'd sometimes describe as an armed prisoner of war camp because there, were, there was very little chance of relief. Resupply was minimal and it, it, it's, a testament to Rokossovsky that he's able to take a situation which could quite easily have been a bit of a headache for the Red Army and make it seem fairly straightforward. Mm -hmm. um, by the time by the time the war is over, by the time the instrument of surrender has been signed in in in, in Reims, I think it is, Rokossovsky yeah. is at the peak of his power. He's he's risen from disgraced officer to saviour of Moscow to um liberator of Stalingrad, having held the line at Kursk architect of armed group centre downfall to then finish up in, in East Prussia. And I think it's it's a huge testament to his character that he could prove his mettle in a variety of different contexts. He's able to attack very well. He's able to defend very well. He's got a very good understanding of logistics, more so, I think, than, than Zhukov and some, of, and some other of his colleagues. And I think he's there's very much a sense of, I've got nothing to lose, because he's already an outsider being Polish and from sort of well-to-do background. But being being a pole from middle class in in the Red Army and a side of the Gulags, every day to him must have seemed like a bit of a bonus because oh my goodness me, I'm proving my my worth and my caliber here. Um, and as I said at the beginning of the program, he's the best of what's already a very very strong crop of youngish Red Army officers who do not get a good crack of the whip until the autumn 1941 really, when the old guard have have, have really fluffed their lines in quite dramatic fashion. They're given their shot and they don't throw it away. Um, and Rokossovsky is integral to that. And th there's a variety of other of his colleagues I could have talked about quite easily tonight. But Rokossovsky is the standout. Not only is he a pole, an outsider in, in a social context, but in terms of a military context, he's an outsider from being middle class and having been a star of the gulags to then a main player in the Soviet Union emerging as one of the victorious nations in World War II. And he's an officer who, in, in my book, really does deserve more credit than he gets. Well, thank you. And just we've got this question here from Rayner here about his subordinates, because you just you just said yourself two seconds ago there are other people you'd like to talk about. So, you know, given the enormity of these fronts that he's commanding, um, are there any kind of notable people that he he um sort of um, fast tracks food under his command that you think are worthy of mention people he identifies who are good at particularly armored warfare or artillery that are names that we in the west should know is there any names that spring to mind the main name that spring to mind um they so they don't fight directly under him at curse but they're they're, they're heavily involved um ivan ludnikov he commands 138th rifle division at, at stalingrad um they really do get a get a, get a kicking in the factory district um Viktor Zoludayev commands uh, Guards Airborne Division at Stalingrad. I think he's under Rokossovsky's command at Kursk. Um, again, does very, very well for himself. Commands a corps later on. Um, it's easier to sort of describe um, fellow front commanders. Um, and on, another honor mention, uh, Ivan Chernyakovsky, um, he fights under Rokossovsky, I think, at Kursk and towards the end of the war. He's, he's killed at the age of 30, I think, in East Prussia. A very, very young officer um, and very, very highly thought of. Yeah, it, it's probably easier to go over the people alongside him who are very competent. So Ivan Konyev, 
um, massive deception. Um, the idea of Maskarovka, which is mass Soviet mass military deception, that's Konyev's specialty, his stock in trade. Um, there's a particular armored officer, a guy called Mikhail Katakov, um, who is one of the the, the, the premier Red Army armored officers. Um, he fights alongside Rokossovsky at Kursk. He, he's very well, he's very highly thought of within Eastern Front circles. Um, in terms of other front commanders, Nikolai Vatutin, um, a colleague Rokossovsky's, he commands the front next door at Kursk. He's he's killed quite young, quite young as well in, in February 19, in February 1944, I think. Um, he's very highly thought of. Again, careful with his men, mindful of the resources at his disposal. Um, it, it's easy to go over front comes, as I said, but definitely look into Vatutin, Konyev, Chernyakovsky, um, there's a couple of others as well, um, Zolodayev and Lyudnikov. They're all perhaps equal to or slightly underneath Rokosovsky, who are immensely constant to what they do. Um, I think also you can almost make a case for looking at Markian Popov. So Popov commands uh Bryansk front at, at, uh, at Kursk. Doesn't quite hit the heights, but he is very highly thought of despite not making martial arts over Union. And the obvious one being Georgi Zhukov, who we all sort of know and some love, some hate, um, thanks to Jason Isaac's fantastic trail in Death Star, as you mentioned earlier. So yeah, there's a, there's a few names that are worth looking into there, um, who've not only fought alongside Rokosovsky, but under him or under his sort of colleagues as it were. Well, I think in a minute we'll discuss kind of his geography and reputations and legacy because, you know, Zhukov is the better known name. We'll discuss it in a minute. But a really good question from David O'Keefe, the Canadian historian who kind of watches every show now, which is, I think, um, definitely worth bringing up because you've obviously highlighted these highs in his career. Are there any negatives along the way that he – because – because under again under the, the the Soviet regime, it's more you have any little failures that gonna gonna come back to haunt you. So in between these big opera, were there any moments where it could have all what fallen apart for him? Do you reckon? Moscow is the main one. I think Moscow is a case. But by, by, by the time Moscow is in the gun sites group centre, the Red Army are having to reconstitute vast formations from scratch. Um, his, his army, 16th Army, were part of uh, a Western Front that had been rebuilt from scratch um, in the space of about eight weeks, I think. And with, with, with that in mind, it could very easily have, have gone horribly wrong, given that the Red Army had had a summer full of defeats at the, hand of, at the hands of the Germans. They're defending their capital, they're, they're, they're struggling to get any footholds. Um, and Rokosovsky is this sort of been recalled from the Gulags, but not proven himself yet. Um, and the where, where Rockstar's positions, they're only an hour and a half or so from central Moscow. They're really not far away at all, mm -hmm. half an hour and a half, two hours. So Mo Mos Moscow is on where, to me, it really could have gone pear-shaped, and it, it, it almost does. Um, I think Stalingrad as well. Stalingrad was by no means a foregone conclusion. There are numerous occasions where, within the city itself, um, Stalingrad front very, very nearly... How, how have their teeth kicked in? Um, there's several occasions where the Germans are looking at the tractor factory and the, the factory district in that city where 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 they really could have, have not gone well, um, where things really, really again, could have gone pear-shaped. And I think some of the preparations for Operation Uranus were really badly affected by the weather, which I guess, I guess isn't a personal failing, but there were things that really could have, have, have happened later on and not gone as well with, with other things in play. Um, so, yeah, Mos Moscow initially and just prior to Operation Uranus at Stalingrad, really, because th those are the main two where it really could have gone wrong. And I think as well, you could make an argument for Kursk, given that um, it's, it's not really Rokossovsky's fault, but given that Pavel Rodmistrov throws away an entire guard's tank army at Prokhorovka and does the same thing again a year later during Bagration on, on Rokossovsky's watch as well, it could very well have been Rokossovsky's um, sort of taking the fall for that, as it were. So yes, <laughs> Moscow... And Stalingrad, prior to Uranus in 1942, November time, those are the main two, I think. But it, it testament to, to Rokosovsky that Moscow is able to improvise, not be afraid to go over the heads of his, his superior officers and, and, and make it work and b essentially buy time for Zhukov to organise a counterattack that throws the Germans back about 180k west of Moscow. And right after that, Rokosovsky is given command of one of the fronts in that region because he's a safe pair of hands. He's proven that even though it's in quite the short term, he's proven that he's a safe pair of hands in a defensive context. And he, he and I think Rokosovsky knows that as well. So yeah, Stalingrad and Moscow were the two where it could really have gone wrong, but credit to him, he doesn't, and he works fantastically well with what he's got at hand. 
Well, um, it's it's testament to your knowledge and the comments and compliments are coming through to you that people clearly understand you know your subject. So that's both a, a, a bit of a mixed blessing because now people are putting you on the spot with complicated questions. So that's good. So the Great Dominion is asking you about um, the relationship with Montgomery and what happened there. If you, if you get anything, you can comment about that because um, – um, Great Dominion is one of, my, one of our kind of regular viewers watches all these things there. So I'll, hand, I'll throw that one at you. Um, I've got to admit, it's not something I've looked into. Um, the the pragmatist in me says that it would have been a meeting of two highly respected senior officers. Um, I think the photo of, it's quite a well-known photo of Zhukov, Rokosovsky, uh, Zhukov, Chief Staff Sokolovsky and Montgomery in Berlin and uh, I think Rokosovsky and Zhukov are wearing Orders of the Bath, I think. I'm not totally sure about that. But I, I think the meeting at Wismar, something I need to look into myself anyway, um, job for tomorrow. I think it would have been a a meeting of great military minds with a respect among professionals. Um, Montgomery, I'm not an expert on, but I gather he was a professional, very much a professional soldier. Rokosovsky is in that same mould. Um, and I, I like to think that well, yes, there was animosity between the East and the West, as well, you know, for the 50 years prior to post World War II. I think initially there, it would have been a meeting of, of, of great military minds and professionals with a quite a, a steep respect for each other. Um, whether that changed later on, it may well have done, but I just don't know. Yeah. yeah. So let's talk about legends and reputations and where they are today, because there's been some interesting conversations. Someone mentioned that and they're, they're coming in thick and fast, which is as, as World War II TV becomes slightly more successful, the sidebar becomes slightly less manageable, which is a good sign, but it's, it shows that we are, we're going somewhere. But someone mentioned the 1949 uh, Russian made film where Rokosovsky's in it, portrayed in it, but Zhukov isn't. So the comment is you can tell kind of, who the darling in 1949-50 is, where Zhukov isn't. And that's in, this is where we're into the historiography ang uh, angle now, because if we do, uh, you were to ask most average World War II buffs, may may Russian general from World War II, and this would have applied before Death of Stalin came out, they would have said Zhukov, wouldn't they? Um, what, why do you think the world has remembered him um, over other, because you know, as you said, there's plenty of front commanders who are worthy of yeah, discussion outside really, really of the are. Soviet Union. Why is was Zhukov particularly good at managing his PR thing? Was he a kind of a pattern in that regard? Why, why, why do we I have think, that one name? I think Zhukov is helped by the fact that he's so not only is he sort of a frontline commander, but he's also the the main representative of Stavka, which was Soviet High Command at the time. He's the main representative from Stavka all on the front line. And not only that, he's also got the fact that he's at Moscow, he's at Leningrad, he, he's shipped into Leningrad in September, he replaces Clement Voroshilov, who's a, an old Bolshevik, you know, t tells him where to go and reorganises Leningrad before, oh wait, Moscow's now in danger, he's brought back to the capital. Zhukov is, he's in discussions prior to Stalingrad, he's in discussions prior to Kursk, he just happens to be there. And I think purely because Zhukov was, I think, recognised a bit earlier because this is down this is tangents a little bit i do apologize but in the late 30s the soviet union and the japanese empire did not get on there's a couple of border conflicts in the late 30s in manchuria and zhukov zhukov takes the japanese to the cleaners in in 1939 at kalkin goal it's the first proper instance of combined arms warfare where infantry armor and aerial assets are combined as one to achieve victory and zhukov is the mastermind of that um so i think it's this pre-war reputation of being a bit of a hero against the Japanese and also just being at all the trouble spots in the initial sort of disastrous first sort of four or five months of the war. Um, in terms of PR, I think Zhukov is well known because he, he's given, uh, I don't know how true this is, this could be, he, you know, he, he said, she said, but allegedly Zhukov, like Rokosovsky, was a horseman, both cavalry officers in the First World War, well, yeah, in the cavalry. Um, Allegedly, uh, the white horse that Zhukov is pictured on, um, Stalin, not an actual horseman at all, um, struggles with it. And, and he sort of says, you're a horseman, you can ride it. And, and Zhukov masters this, this this horse. And the images of that June 1945 parade are Rokosovsky and Zhukov on Stalin's together, taking the salute of, 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 the red, of, of these Red Army formations on Red Square. And I think that has played in quite heavily as well. Um, it, I think it's a case of Zhukov's competence being rewarded by being sent to the triple spots and just happening to have fostered quite a well-known image of himself.
Um, I can't think of another way to explain it because I think, in terms of competence, Zhukov was the general. Rokosovsky was was not in terms of having the capacity to instigate combined arms offensives and just choosing not to, which works against him. In, in look at the Silver Heights, referred to it earlier. Zhukov sort of panics and throws in several tank armies, which were the, the reserve this operation. Causes traffic jams, causes all sorts of problems. Using men as a battering ram worked against him, but despite that, it's his image of being at all the trouble spots, Stavka's sort of ace in the hole, as it were, on a, a grand strategy level, and also just through through no sort of design of his own, but also no fault of his own, manufacturing his image. I think I think Rokosovsky was in, in that they were both professional soldiers. Just Zhukov was perhaps a bit more sort of. I'm ready for my close-up, Mr. Demille, sort of thing. When Rokosovsky perhaps was not. Um, Zhukov perhaps has the glamour advantage in that regard, but as soldiers, both both have very strong images. It's just Rokosovsky isn't as glamorous because of his gulag exploits as well, I think. I mean, absolutely. And that, that would apply, I think, to a lot of the generals in all theatres we know the most about are the ones, or we discussed the most, are the ones that knew how to play the PR, MacArthur, Patton, Montgomery, Mark Clark, um, you know, the list goes on. And those that Miles Dempsey, who don't go into that kind of PR thing, are the ones that are the lesser generals. Um, Courtney Hodges, for example, didn't you never you never heard much about him in the press. So I think it's that that you know, if if you if you caught the attention of the press and you caught that because you want it it can lead to then the competition who is the star here and st Stalin clearly wants to be seen especially post-war when we're getting the historiography aspect of things as the architect of the victory and of course he depended on his generals but st Stalin and that's why all those Russian made films of the 50s are very much Stalin I mean I'm surprised that actually have him driving tanks because he pretty much is shown to be you know Doing all the all the maneuvers, all yeah. the advances, all the things on I the map. It's all started, isn't it? So, so Rokosovsky seems to know to me how to play the game, and maybe that's all. It all goes back to that three years of of gulags where you have to learn how to not provoke people. You have to learn when there's random beatings, when there's random torture. You have to know how to kind of bide your time, stay in the background, not piss people off. Not and and I, I you know, if we're going to ask. I haven't read as widely as you have on the subject, but if I was going to, uh, you know, put my finger on the th the critical part of it, yes, first of all, always important. Yes, child is important, but I would say those three years in the gulag are because he's reminded by that every day. The metal teeth, the, the, the that's that's in his head. The lack yes, of toenails too. Sorry, the lack of toenails. The lack of toenails. Yeah, lack of toenails. So so that's in his head all the time. He has spent three years where you're worried about every single thing you do. So I think he's a, a very good. Um, uh, player of the game, but I think, and David O'Keefe mentioned this is also the post war. How did either of them, both of them, get on with Khrushchev and the others that are jostling for power after war? So, I mean, I know we're going down a potential rabbit hole now, but you, <laughs> you talked about his ability on the battlefield. Um, what was his ability with dealing with the politicians? Because that's that's something that, for example. Eisenhower was good at. Eisenhower yeah. was good at the meetings with George the Sixth. Good at the meetings with the uh, General Marshall and the, the well, you know, I, I FDR. Like and like that. How, how was Rokosovsky's score on that kind of diplomacy uh, uh, count? I think Rokosovsky let his ability do the talking. I, I honestly do think that he's a soldier's soldier, um, and he, he perhaps could have been, you know, very very PR savvy. But I think he just chose not to. I think it was just a job to do let my ability, my competence and how I handle the situation and how I deal with people around me, let that handle the situation. Um, it's quite telling though that Rokosovsky, late after the war, much is made by the, the, the I, I don't say puppet government in Poland, but the, the, the communist leader in Poland, much is made of his being a son of Warsaw, he's he's made Ministry of Defence, yet there's a, a, a saying, he, he's after the war quoted as saying, the Poles think I'm a Russian and the Russians think I'm a Pole. He doesn't really fit in anywhere. And I think that comes into his not being quite as PR PR savvy as, as some of his colleagues, you know, well, Zhukov, namely. Um, and like I said, I think he lets his, his generalship do the talking and he does the talking in a, in a loud, proud and ultimately more deserving of credit way. 
And that might have been to mention this question we had earlier about um, his reaction to your experience with the Warsaw Uprising, because, he, you know, he is Polish. I mean, you know, when we had that show I did earlier in the year or last year now with um, Douglas Nash about the battles around Warsaw and the and the fact that the, you know, the Soviet Ar Red Army did not go in, do, do, do we know anything about what his feelings would have been about that on a personal level because of his, you know, his background is, is Polish? Did, or does he just know when to keep his shut, mouth shut and, and go with the flow? I think with, with the Red Army's decision not to go into Warsaw, I think that's more a case of being pragmatic rather than leaving the home army to, you know, to be in a sort of cavalry against the Indian sort of situation. I think it's a case of by by that time the Red Army had been on the offensive for a good a good four or six weeks and they were they they just had to catch up and let the supply lines just do their thing. And I think Privately, Rokosovsky may well have thought, actually, no, I, I want to go and give them a hand. But I think the, the pragmatist in me, and I think perhaps in him, may, may well have said, actually, we've been on the offensive for a good good six weeks now. Uh, do we really want to get embroiled in a city fight after that um, experience where our supply lines are still trying to catch up? Um, the men on the ground will need some sort of refit, resupply. Um, the tank will need, will need fuel, spare parts, ammunition. I think it's less a case of, of, of Stalin right washing his hands of the home army. I think it's more a case of the, the pragmatist in Rokosovsky saying, well, I'd love to possibly, you know, we, we'll, we'll never know. But I think it is the pragmatist in him saying, we can't, we just don't have the means. I mean, the, the, the Red Army does get bridgeheads across the Vistula, but they're not particularly deep. They're not particularly well reinforced initially. It, it's not the ideal springboard to then a six-week defence operation through difficult country is not the springboard to then jump into a city fight to help out some partisans. It just isn't from a, from a pragmatic, logical point of view. And I think that's what sort of prevailed with, with, with Roksovsky's decisions in, the, in that context, because he may, well have, he may well have wanted to, but being a soldier soldier and being very, very mindful of the men at his disposal and the resources disposal, I think it was more that as opposed to Stalin saying, no, wash your hands of them. They're not important. So pragmatism over sort of being the, you know, as, as, as Edward Fox says in, in uh, Rich Too Far, rather than being the cavalry riding to the rescue of the homesteaders, just being pragmatic and just waiting for being in a better position to do that. Which suggests, because, you know, you said about he lets his, his, his work on the battlefield be his PR for him is that you know we've talked earlier you spoke earlier about him standing up to Stalin when he believes it's necessary but standing up based on sound military reasoning that he can show to him with kind of like pie charts and graphs whereas maybe the Warsaw issue was one where his heart may have said we should do something about Warsaw but he's you know he's practical experience his generalship said you know what this is a sticky wicket i could i could maybe try and call in a favor with the boss and do something maybe but it's not i haven't got a sound reason to do it so it, it suggests he's very clever at knowing when to which battle to take on you don't take battles on you can't win and i mean that figuratively and metaphorically you know when he's got cause to stand with against stalin and, and stand up for his it's based on that here's that here's my reasoning so he, you know it, it's extraordinary so i think to finish off well, well we had a question from um jeff white about how did his soldiers perceive him then and i think i'd like you to expand on that as well today because we know and you know we're talking about this generational thing and david o'keefe suggesting you go off to russia and start learning all this stuff and i agree with him you know and you've wish, got 20 years on me but the thing is we now know there's this interesting resurgence of fascination with stalin in russia there's no there's a the great patriotic war is going through a another boost of um of um interest and the museums and expansion of things so what did his soldiers think about him then and what do they think about him now is it the same or what and, and was he kind of forgotten for sort of 30 years in the middle do you have any idea about that um i think that if it's out there i haven't found it i'd love to um but i i think a lot of i think the the men under his plan would have thought let's not worry about how competent the boss is let's just worry about getting through the day with and, and trying not to die basically i, th I think if if those, if those discussions were had um they've not been unearthed um I'm, I'm not really sure how 
if, if there's any of that to, to go on at all, I've not found it. I'm not aware of anyone who has found it. If anyone, it would be perhaps Dr. Garner. Um, mm. I like to think it was thought of quite highly. Um, but th again, there's no way of knowing. I think the soldiers would have been too concerned with just getting through the day and trying not to die um, rather than what I thought of, of, of the boss, of the boss, of the boss, of the boss sort of thing. But what about, you? what about now? Do you think he's the kind of figure that's likely to get resurgent, or is it going to is Zhukov kind of the horse to back in that sense of you know in twenty years' time, if I'm dead and there's biographies coming out of Russia, do you think do you think it's all going to be Zhukov still, or do you think there's a fighting chance some of these other front commanders will will get their recognition? Well, that feeling? I, I really hope not because it, it, it's very difficult to pin down one particular competent Soviet officer to look at because. The vast majority of them, they really are all very, very good. Um, they, they, they won't have gotten everything right, obviously, and that's you know there'll, there'll be examples of that. But it, it's very hard to pin down just the one. And I like to think that it perhaps won't shift to another individual, but I like to think that the historiography will sort of type, sort of show that actually it'll be worth looking at the collective because it wasn't just one man who 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 dragged the Soviet Union kicking and screaming through World War Two. It was several very competent individuals. You could very, you could quite easily make a case for, um, for example, Front Commander Fyodor Tolbukhin. He has experience of Stalingrad, which then serves him very well in Budapest at the end of 1944, start 1945, and in Vienna in spring 1945. You could look at Konyev and his military deception and his his barnstorming drive to Prague at the end of the war. You could look at um, Govorov and Moretskov, who are two commanders. Uh, Govorov commands Leningrad Front. Moretskov commands Volkov front, and they they spend basically best part of four three years trying to fight their way towards each other um, to relieve Leningrad. Um, and I think that there there are a lot there are lots of Soviet officers who are as deserving, if not more than deserving, of of Georgi Zhukov to have time spot because Zhukov's been there since since the end of the war. It's high time that if not in in the east, may well in the west, we start to look at the Soviet sort of operationalization and think actually. There's more competence here than we have given them credit for for the last 60, 70, 80 years. And we we, we, we can do so much better in terms of understanding them and recognising actually the Red Army wasn't just manpower. It was very, very good, very, very well thought out military thinking. Um, there's a lot there's lots of individuals who I could, I could talk for hours and hours and hours, but I can't. There's a lot of individuals who are deserving of recognition of further study and of praise because it's not just one man in the same way that it's not just Montgomery it's not just Patton there's a lot of people there who are deserving as much in within the Soviet Union as within the Western Allies who are deserving I've just seen the comments about Chuikov as well there's a lot of even sort of divisional and army commanders and corps commanders too who who really do need to be looked at and recognized as being fantastic combat leaders well, I think this is where I'm going to, you know, put some praise on you as well yourself, Ollie, because as people are saying in the comments there, this this study and recognition can only develop if there are people willing to do that work. And the thing is, we all know within the peer group of people of your age group and younger who are getting into World War II, it's the same old, same old that often brings people in. It's the 101st Airborne, it's the Big Red One, it's Arnhem, it's the same old things that come in again and again. And that's fantastic. You know, I, I'm looking forward to, you know, new studies about Arnhem and all those things there. But the 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 contribution of the Eastern Front needs to be addressed. I don't in balance. I, I don't like this 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 kind of modern thing about dismissing the role of the Western. This kind of, it comes up around D Day now that actually you know D Day wasn't yeah. really anything with all the Russians. Didn't it. No, let's not swing it too much that way, but definitely acknowledge it. You know, I've got friends who've gone and spoken um, in 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 Moscow on their big history conferences there. And you know, and they they have this massive interest there, and the the Russians are, and not just the Russians, the other former Soviet bloc countries are showing interest in their exploits back in the war. But we also need the Western, the Western <clears throat> historians to do it as well. We need people like you to to carry on this because it's a a collective view of World War Two that's important. And yes, I buy books on the Hundred First Airborne as well because I need to keep up to date. But yeah, I I think it's important to broaden our interests and broaden our understanding. So yeah, this is really really fascinating conversation. Um, and you are welcome back to come back at any other point. Either look at a particular battle, of, for example, yeah. or a particular unit, or we can do something else about leadership. Sure. This has fitted in very well to what we're talking about and how these people fit in and. 
it, I, it's, it's been a pleasure to be on. Well, it, thank you for having I'm me. very pleased that the blend of people we're talking about, because what happens in, I kind of put the feelers out to people and say, have I got, and it, you know, yes, we've got some old favorites pattern, you know, um, yeah. Donald, but also, <laughs> you know, Simmons on Thursday tomorrow with, with Dr. Blood, we're going to be talking about some of the SS leadership. It's kind of a nice balanced, a balanced week. It's worked out quite well. So that's, thank you to people like yourself coming on and doing, it's sharing been a your pleasure. Thank you so, for having me on. And thank you to everyone for watching as well. It's been an enormous amount of fun. Well, I will just remind people what we've got coming up. So tomorrow, Dr. Phil Blood, who's actually watching, coming on, talking about SS leadership. There was a fantastic thread on Twitter the day before yesterday about whether or not it's valid to discuss the SS in any way at all, because they were some very nasty people. Yeah, we can discuss. Leadership doesn't have to be good. You can be a good leader and a shit human being. That We can still be some really interesting <laughs> conversations tomorrow with Dr. <laughs> Phil Blood. Yeah, very. And and then, of course, we've got Patton with Kevin Hemel on Friday. And we've got, before that, we've got John Nelson Ricard talking about Guy Simmons, a figure I'm sure all the Canadian historians will be out in strength for that one there, because he, Simmons, is someone that kind of divides people um, as I think all interesting people end up being a bit Marmite. I think they always end up being a bit, some people love them, some people hate them. But I Definitely. think for those who don't know much about the Eastern Front, I think you've illuminated someone that I think people will go and do some investigative work there and, and do some more reading. So fantastic. So there we are, folks. I will see you all again tomorrow, same time, 7 p.m. Uh, UK time for Dr. Phil Blood. Uh, Ollie, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Uh, your Twitter you. Uh, details in the description below. I do urge we go and check out your blog. There's some fantastic stuff there. And yeah, I feel we've been on that kind of, that was your debut performance. I feel we're going to yeah. see all these things now. I think I've got in the beginning, you'll be, you'll be, you'll be going on to doing stuff on Newsnight and, you know, Channel oh, 4 documentaries. Oh, so yeah, it was great. a journalist, so the option's always there. <laughs> yeah, no, it was really good. So thanks everybody for watching, folks. I will see you all again tomorrow night. This is Paul Woodhatch for World War II TV, reminding you all to check out the links, check out Patreon, and we'll see you all again tomorrow. Cheers for watching.